Pesci y Cumestis. Hello and welcome to my first lecture on the linear regression model. What is the linear regression model anyway? Well, to introduce the linear regression model, we can start with something that you're already familiar with, production functions. In macroeconomics, we use production functions to describe how much labor and capital we need to produce a certain amount of output, or GDP. Note that when macroeconomists talk about production functions, they're not really interested in discussing the details of the production process and um, workers hammering and sawing. No, they just want to describe how much labor and capital we need to describe a certain output um, to produce a certain output level. Well, a linear regression model is pretty much the same. It describes how inputs translate into an output quantity. Just like with the production function, we are not interested in modeling the details of the transformation process. We're just interested in learning which input combination, combinations lead to a certain output level. So how does this framework of production functions help us investigate real economic problems? Let me give you one example. You might have heard that excessive smoking and drinking during a pregnancy is bad for the baby's health. If you didn't believe that already, how would you go about describing this relationship and investigating this relationship? Well, here's one way to think about it. At some point in time, a woman enters um, her pregnancy and now the baby will be in her tummy for nine months. During that time, she gets to decide what she does. She gets to decide how much she drinks and how much she smokes. Then at some point, the baby is born and we observe whether it is a healthy baby or a less healthy baby. So now where are the inputs and the outputs and the production function in all of this? Well, the behaviors that the woman chooses, you can think of as inputs. So one input could be how many cigarettes did the woman smoke? And then the health of the baby is the output. And then this little arrow between the behaviors and, and the, the, the smiling baby, that is our production or our transformation process. To um, investigate whether, for example, smoking is bad for the baby's health, we do not have to understand the details of the transformation process, like what is happening at a, at a, on a chemical level. Um, no, we just have to know whether increasing the input um, smoked cigarettes decreases the health of the baby. Let me give you another example. As a teacher, I'm often thinking about what I can do to make my students more successful. For example, I might wonder whether making them work harder and work more would increase their final exam scores. How can I think about this in, term, in terms of a linear regression model? Well, at some point in time, a student starts their first econometric class. While they're taking the class, they make certain behavior choices. For example, they choose how much um, they study and how much time they spend on other fun activities. Eventually, there will be an exam and the students will receive a score on that exam. The input that I'm interested in um, here would be the amount of study hours. The outcome would be the final exam score. And the little arrow here, that would be the production process. Again, I don't really have to understand all the details of the production process. I don't have to understand what students exactly um, do, sort of how they take notes, how all that information enters their brains. I, I just have to know whether increasing this input study time increases the final exam score. Let me give you more details about the linear regression model. First, there are the inputs. There are different kinds of inputs. 
The first group of inputs that I want to talk about are called regressors. Regressors are variables that are observable. That means that at least potentially we can measure them and we can collect data on them. There are two types of regressors. The first kind of regressor is called a variable of interest. What constitutes a variable of interest depends on your research question. For example, when I was wondering before about the effect of study time on exam scores, the variable of interest was study time. The second type of regressor is called a control variable. We'll talk um, more late, uh, later on in this course about what control variables are and why they are important. In addition to the regressors which are observed, there are also unobserved inputs. For now, I'll, let's just call them unobserved inputs. All of these inputs are fed into some transformation process. We are not going to um, go into the exact mechanisms of this transformation process. We'll just treat it as a black box or a blue box, if you will. So for each configuration of inputs, this blue box gives us a certain um, amount of output, except sort of in the context of the uh, linear regression model, we don't call it output, we usually call it outcome. Just like the regressor, the outcome is observed. So the linear regression model has observed components, namely the regressors and the outcome. And it also has unobserved components, namely the, the unobserved inputs. And an important assumption of the linear regression model is that all the inputs and the output are numbers. That is very convenient because it allows us to use random variables to describe the distribution of output and inputs in a population. So let's have a collection of random variables. The random variable y describes the distribution of the outputs in the population. And then the random variables x subscript give us the distribution of the various inputs in the population. Well, now that we're talking about the linear regression law, we want to use sort of the, um, the, the specific terms for the linear regression law. So rather than calling it an output, we call y the outcome. And then we'll need regressors. So let's say that the first k inputs are observed. So they will be our regressors. And those will be either you know, variables of interest or control variables. Then all the other inputs that are, that are not regressors, so x k plus 1 up to x capital K, they will be unobserved inputs. Let's make this abstract notation a little more concrete in the context of my um, study time example. Why the outcome is the exam score on the final exam. Then x1 could be study time. That is, it would be our variable of interest. x2, let's say that is number of the number of statistics courses that um, students have already taken before they enter the econometrics class. But conceivably, this is also um, easy to measure. So it could be observed and therefore be a, another regressor. And if, since it's not the variable of interest, it will be a control variable. Then finally, let's um, say that x3 is mathematical ability. Now, that is very hard to get a good a measurement of. So it would probably not be possible to observe that, very precisely at least. So it would be an unobserved input. So in this example, I would have a total number of three inputs. So capital K would be three. And I would have two observed um, inputs, so two regressors. So um, lowercase k is equal to two. Before we move on, I want to remind you of how we use random variables to describe a population. For simplicity, suppose that our population is really small. It consists only 
of three individuals, Alice, Ben and Carl. So one point in our population is omega equal to Alice. That's Alice. To describe Alice, we evaluate the random variables at omega equal to Alice. So Alice has 86 points on the exam. She has studied for 19 hours. She has taken two statistics classes before starting the econometrics class and she has a mathematical ability of four, whatever that means. Next, let me put a little bit more structure on the transformation process that is on this little blue box in the middle. We can think of the transformation process as a function that assigns outcome levels to different input configurations. But we'll assume even more. We assume that we can write y as a sum. So the first part of the sum is a function of all the regressors and you know, this part we call explain part. And the second um, part of the sum is a function of all the unobserved inputs and this part we call the unexplained part. So let's focus on the unexplained part for now. So um, potentially a lot of different variables can feed into this, any number. And since they are all unobserved, we will never know sort of what's going on inside this u function. So we, we might as well just lump all of those together and just model all of the unexplained part at once by one random variable. And this random variable we call u. I like to call u the unobserved component because that's what it is. It is the part of the transformation process that we uh, cannot observe. Uh, another common name for it is error term. This is the term, um, this is the word used in most textbooks. I don't like it a lot because it's not very descriptive of what the U economically stands for. Now that we have defined U, there's a slightly shorter way of writing um, down our linear regression model. We can write Y as the sum of the function m evaluated at the regressors plus our unobserved component u. The function m is called a regression curve. At this point, it could potentially be a very complex function. However, for the linear regression model, we're going to make our lives very easy and assume that it, has a, that it takes a particularly simple, a linear form. m combines the axes in a linear way. We're not going to pin down exactly how to know exactly uh, how m translates axis into a number, we would have to know these betas. So, so what are these betas? These betas are numbers. We don't know which numbers they represent. We remember that m is part of a transformation process and what this transformation process looks like is determined by economic realities that we might not completely understand. So we don't want to take um, a stand on what these betas are. And we just use um, the, this uh, the notation, uh, so we just use the betas as placeholders for the unknown true values. The beta naught is called an intercept and the other betas that multiply axes are called slope coefficients. Let's again consider our study time example. In our study time example, there are two regressors, study time and the number of statistics courses that the student has already taken. So there are two axes in the regression curve and three coefficients, the intercept beta naught and the two slope coefficients beta one and beta two. In real life, obviously we wouldn't know um, what the numerical values of these coefficients are, but for this example, we can just pretend we knew um, the exact, exact values for all the betas. So let's say beta naught is 12, beta one is two, and beta two is 15. Now that we know um, the regression curve exactly, we can evaluate it um, for, um, for example, Alice. So if we evaluate the regression curve for Alice, 
we get 12 plus 2 times 19 because Alice has studied for 19 hours plus 15 times 2 because Alice is already taking two statistics classes. So that's 80. So Alice gets 80 points from her regressors. Then Alice girl also gets some exam uh, points from, um, from her mathematical ability. So let's suppose that the function u is given by 1 times uh, 1.5 times x3. So for Alice, who has a mathemat mathematical ability of 4, then uh, the observed component is 1.5 times 4 equal 6. So she gets 6 points from unobserved factors. So the total score that Alice gets on the exam will be 80 from her regressors and 6 from the unobserved component. So a total score of 86. A good strategy for getting used to working with this kind of model is to play around a little bit with it. That's what we do now. We've just figured out Alice's exam score. Now let's figure out Ben's exam score. I'll give you the answer in a second, but I suggest that you first try to figure it out yourself. So pause the video, take a pen and paper and do the calculations yourself. Did you figure it out? Ben's exam score is 83. Now let's turn to Carl. For Carl, we know his exam score, it's 75. But we don't know his mathematical ability. But we have all the information that we need to figure out his mathematical ability. Again, I'll give you the answer in a second, but I suggest you first try to solve it yourself. So how did you go about it? Well, here's how I would do it. We have Carl's exam score 75. So we subtract the intercept 12. So that leaves us with um, 63. Then we subtract 2 times 27, so 54. So 63 minus 54, that's 9. And then 2 thirds of 9 that's 6 and 6 is the answer. We will organize our ideas about the linear regression model using a series of formal mathematical assumptions. Our first assumption, let's call it OS1, just summarizes what we've assumed so far about how the regressors and the unobserved component translate into an outcome y. So if you think about it in terms of sort of the production function, this imposes some structure, this imposes a functional form on this transformation process that translates inputs into an output. Just using our assumption all as one, we can already do interesting things. For example, we can talk about causal effects. So uh, here's Alice. And Alice is wondering if she had just studied two extra hours, how would that have affected her exam score? So Alice thinks that there's a mechanical relationship between how much she studies and um, how well she does on the exam. She's, um, Alice um, hypothesizes that there is a causal relationship. What's a causal relationship? A causal relationship between two things means that if you change the one thing, then mechanically the other thing will change as well. So for example, if you study two additional hours, then this behavior change will lead to a change in your exam score. So hopefully an increase in your exam score. So this um, increase in your exam score that is the causal effect of your behavior, uh, of your change in behavior. So you can think of a causal effect as a difference. It is the difference between a hypothetical outcome, so the outcome that you would have obtained if you had studied two extra hours, and your actual outcome, so where you that you obtained where you um, didn't 
increase or didn't change your study time and you just kept studying it at your base level. A very important concept in, uh, in, in the context of causal effects is the um, notion of ceteris set paribus that is Latin for keeping everything else constant. So when you construct your hypothetical scenario, you're really supposed to only change one thing. So here you only, you know, Alice is only uh, allowed to study two additional hours and everything else has to be the same in both scenarios. Otherwise, when you're looking at the difference in outcomes, you don't know what caused this difference. So how do you figure out causal effects? Here's a suggestion for how to answer Alice's question. So we first have to learn the base outcome. So Alice we just lives her life. She gets to study her 19 hours and at the end we observe her exam score. Next, we travel back in time. So we put Alice in a time machine and we're back at the beginning. And Alice gets to live her life again and she will do so exactly as she did before, except that she now studies two extra hours for her, her econometrics exam. And she's not allowed to change anything else about her life because ceteris paribus, right? At the end, we observe her exam score. Now we have two exam scores, we can compare them and this will be the causal effect. Well, the problem with this approach is that we'll always have this one negative person who just says, well, time machines don't exist. So we're not allowed to use time machines. What can we do instead? Well, we can use our linear regression model. We already know how to compute Alice's exam score in, in the base scenario. And I've emphasized the 19 here. So 19 is the number of hours that Alice studies. In the same way, we can compute um, an exam score for the hypothetical scenario where she studies 21 hours. Then to compute the causal effect, we subtract the um, second line from the first line. So we have two times the difference in, in study times um, because everything else cancels out. So that's four. So yes, um, Alice, the causal effect of increasing your study time by two hours is four extra points on the exam. More generally, we might wonder what happens in any linear regression model if we increase the amount of x1 that we are using by delta units. And delta here is just you know, any difference that we might want to look at. Again, we can write down the base outcome. This is just our linear regression model. We can also write down our hypothetical outcome where we increase the amount of x1 that we're using by delta. To compute the causal effect um, of changing x1, we just subtract the second line from the first line and we get beta1 times delta. So as Alice here summarizes for us, for every extra unit of x1 that we're using, we get beta1 extra units um, of outcome. That means if we're interested in causal effects related to changing x1, all we have to know to be able to compute them is the value of the slope coefficient beta1. Beta1 is also called the marginal effect of x1. What's the marginal effect? Well, a marginal means small. So a marginal effect is the effect of a small change in x1 on the outcome. We already know that if we increase x1 by one unit, then we will increase the outcome by beta one units. But is a change of one unit, is that small? In mathematics, we have a sort of the notion of small changes is related to the notion of the slope of a curve. The slope of a curve is tells us by how much the curve changes in the, in the y direction if we make a tiny an infinitesimal change in the x direction. The regression curve is a linear function, so it has a constant slope and its slope in the 
x1 direction is beta 1. So in particular, um, beta 1 is equal to the partial derivative of the regression curve with respect to um, x1. Now I want to talk a little bit about how we write down our linear regression model. So you might already find it quite tedious to, um, to keep track of what all of the axes stand for. So it often makes sense to use more descriptive names. For example, we could write score instead of y, which would make it easier to remember that y stands for the exam score. Or we could use you know, write study time instead of x1, or courses instead of x2. And then we would write just um, our linear regression model as you know, exam score is given by beta naught plus beta 1 study time plus beta 2 courses plus some unobserved component. So if you have a specific um, application in mind, this is often the better way to write down the linear regression model. However, we still will use sort of this um, other way with sort of the y and the axis if we talk about you know, the general idea of a linear regression model and maybe don't have a specific application in mind. This is the end of the video. To conclude, let me summarize the most important insights from this video. First, we discovered that many economic questions can in fact be phrased in terms um, of questions about production functions. A production function um, describes a relationship between inputs and an output. We introduced the linear regression model, which we can interpret as some kind of production function. We used the linear regression model to compute causal effects. And these causal effects turned out to be related to the coefficients, um, to the slope coefficients of the linear regression model.